Bob Merrill. I'm from Caledonia, Minnesota. Uh, that's uh, just uh, west of Lacrosse. If you've been to the Moses Conference, we're, we're pretty close to there. And uh, uh, <clears throat> my wife and our family, um, our journey kind of started here. Uh, we've been uh, uh, no-tilling for well, it's about just about 20 years. And uh, back in uh, 20, I think 2014, uh, my wife, she actually, uh, she had a, she had an allergic reaction, and and uh, it was actually due uh, to wheat, and it really uh, sparked some things that uh, that really made us think about why we do what we do, and so that kind of led us into the organic, uh, and and obviously no tilling for several years, that really, uh, that was that was you know we found out about you know Jeff Moy and the organic no tilling, so that just kind of started us on the path to. Uh, the organic no till so it's it's great great to have a lot of people here with so much interest and diversity and, and uh, so it's 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 been a, it's certainly been an interesting uh, quest here for us but if I hit the right button let's see which one is it? Okay. all right so that was back in uh, in in 2014 and uh, we we had some uh, CRP and, and like like I had mentioned, the farm had been no-till for 19 years. We had been corn and soybean, alfalfa. And so what we did, uh, we had some CRP come out, and, and uh, starting small was, was certainly a benefit to us. Uh, we had some CRP. It was just a little over eight acres, and so we thought, you know, that's a, that's a great number to start with. We feel we could risk that, and so that's what we did. We, uh, we did chisel plow it, finished it, and we put in about three and a half bushels of rye in August. Uh, and uh, we did put a little dairy manure on that as well from a neighboring dairy. Uh, had a really good catch in the fall. Over, overwintered really well. Um, you can see it there. In, uh, that was in, in real early spring. Uh, so we, we, had a, we had a really good catch. Uh, didn't really know what to expect. Um, there's another picture there uh, a little bit uh, later in the spring with one of the kids. Um, and just based on what I had read in the book uh, and, and talking with others, uh, we felt that we had enough biomass there that we could hopefully use the roller crimper. And so uh, as this is maturing, we're, we're, we're kind of working on, uh, you know, do we purchase a roller crimper? Do we borrow one? What do we do? And so we decided that uh, I'm fortunate that, that, well, I don't know if you want to call it fortunate that I have to work a job off the farm <laughs> to survive. but. I'm a, a wastewater operator uh, by trade and a public works director, and so uh, I work with a welder. And so I gave him the plans from the Rodale Institute, and so we came up with uh, an idea uh, based on what Jeff had, had uh, in, in his uh, roller printer, and so we tried to build one. And uh, it turned out, uh, there's a picture of Rye getting close to the antithesis. Uh, there's the crimper there um, that we built. and. Uh, I just went to the local bridge uh, builder, and, and we got a piece of uh, piling there. I think it was 16-inch tubing, 3 ace wall tubing. Um, uh, I wanted it heavy. Um, you know, where we're at, the slopes, uh, it's, it's very sloping land, and I wanted to be sure that when I go over it, you know, that, that uh, we, get a, we get a good kill and termination with the rise. So we built it heavy. Um, we did... Uh, we can fill it with water. Uh, that adds, uh, I think I figured, about 1,600 pounds. Um, probably the biggest challenge with building our own crimper was, was actually getting those fins to, to uh, tip back about that 7 to 10 degrees. Um, that, that was quite a challenge. <laughs> but we built the jig and were able to, to flex them steels back. Uh, and then I had a, a company out of Chatfield, Minnesota, actually cut the 4-inch cut the, the, uh, plates there, and uh, we got them curled around. So it, it actually turned out pretty good, um, worked well. So that was about a week before that we finished the crimper, and then this was May 25th. Uh, we had a terrible windstorm come through, and it blew it all down, and I thought, oh, what am I going to do? Uh, and I think maybe Mark will touch on this after a while. Um, I, I panicked a little bit because I thought, well, it's laying on the ground. Uh, I guess that's probably a good time for me to go out and... Uh, and roll it. And, and at that time, it was about that 50, probably 50% 50 anthesis, maybe 60%. 
So the next day I went out and uh, there's two fields here and uh, we crimped it and it, it actually went down really nice. Uh, this was the 26th of May. Um, came back with uh, the no-till no drill there. Now we seeded a population of about 180,000 seeds um, on 15-inch centers. Um, it, it, I, just, I had to go slow. You know, it just, it just took a while. So uh, didn't want to get in a hurry. Wanted to get that, that seed in the ground. Um, and there's a picture of it. Not a very good picture, but uh, that was a couple days later. Um, and there's the beans coming up. I apologize, I don't have the date on there, but the beans coming up in there. Um, there's another, the other field there that had blown down. And just to kind of show you the contrast of the rye, the residue that was on there. Um, there's the beans uh, coming up. Really, I was really impressed with the amount of weed pressure. There was very little in the field. Um, there's another picture there. Uh, as the season progressed, the, the beans got tremendously tall, and, uh, you know, they looked really good. I thought, you know, for a first time, just kind of gambling a little bit, what I thought, it, it didn't turn out just too bad. And uh, there's our, our youngest son there. He was standing there. We were pulling a few weeds. We did have a few Canadian thistle that was in there, um, but not nothing too major. So we spent a few hours uh, uh, with gloves on pulling thistle. <laughs> but there's there's the field. Uh, that was that would have been about in early October. Uh, we tried combining it. We had to wait a little bit longer. You know, on the conventional side, we were always, you know, October 1st, we were combining beans. This is obviously a little bit different with organic. Um, but, you know, the beans turned out really well. I'll back up there a little bit. But um, we averaged about 48 bushel. That was both fields together. And, and uh, I felt that that was, that was a pretty good, pretty good first-time trial. And that's really what it was about. You know, we didn't necessarily have to do any tillage in the spring and, and um, tried to follow nature as best as we could. Um, some of the other things that we're trying here, that was, we're transitioning. Our last year of transition is this year. Uh, this was just a, a winter wheat field, never planted winter wheat. Um, I planted that about 140 uh, pounds an acre. That would have been in the middle of October. And, uh, you know, it actually turned out pretty good. I think I had about 57 bushels to the acre of wheat on that. Um, and I was able to use that in the transition to, to use that as cover crop seed on the conventional side. So I had, I had a home for that, uh, and we got some diversity in the system. Um, there was an eight-way cover crop mix that we came back with in that wheat field that you've seen. Um, and, you know, our bees really like that. Um, you know, we've been raising honeybees here for several years, and uh, it's just nice to see that, uh, you know, you can have something else growing other than, than corn and beans and, and get some diversity in the system. But um, there's another picture of that. Uh, a couple other quick items. Um, I have grown some winter wheat in another field, and I planted Austrian winter peas. And the Austrian winter peas really did well. They overwintered extremely well. Um, and what I did, I just harvested that wheat. And uh, we took and I screened, I, I bought an old screener and I screened the Austrian winter peas off and used use that in another cover crop mix uh, on the conventional side. Um, so th they did really well. Um, we did do some, we tried some hairy vetch and corn. Uh, two years ago, the hairy vetch did not survive. Um, so this year, uh, matter of fact, in, in this field, uh, we did try some hairy vetch uh, I think I put in about 25 pounds of the acre. I put some rye in there. Um, so we're, we're going to try and, and, you know, hairy vetch roll down again uh, this year. So we'll see. I'm a little scared. Uh, I know Aaron said that <laughs> June 20th is kind of a date. And so, you know, I guess we'll, we'll kind of wait and see. But uh, that hasn't been tilled for, well, it, you know, it's been 19 years. And so maybe there's something to do with tillage that will help speed that along. But it hasn't been tilled. I don't know. Um, but that's just a few things we're trying. Oh, I guess that was in there. My wife and the honeybees. And that was just one of the other things I wanted to say. Uh, she took that picture uh, to get down in the field and look around. And it's really funny what you see if you look uh, at the soil, the ground, uh, as to what's going on. So uh, I guess that's all I have. Thank you. 
one last item here. There's a book I would encourage, uh, you know, if anybody wants to look at it, uh, to read, it's called The Soil Owner's Manual. It's uh, by John Stitka. Uh, he attended a soil health conference out in Redwood Falls, and it's a real easy read. Uh, gives a lot of good information on uh, the soil. So, thank you.